Today's scripture is in reading Matthew 28 from 1 through 7. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and become like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, he has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. God bless the reading of his word. What we celebrate today, the resurrection of Jesus, was first reported by an angel. Do you believe in angels? According to the surveys, you probably do. And according to the surveys, you probably do, even if you're not sure God exists. Those of us who believe the Bible, we are more likely to say we believe in angels. But I think many of us believe in angels because we're supposed to, because it's in the Bible and it's in the creeds. But we are a little embarrassed about modern day angel stories. I think some of us can identify with what Tish Harrison Warren wrote. In scripture, she said, angels are all over the place, yet until recently, I basically ignored angels. Believing in the supernatural can frankly be a little embarrassing in my urban circles. Then, to my surprise, I noticed that I developed a habit sometime in the first years of my daughter's life of asking God to send angels to protect her. I realized slowly that I was increasingly thinking about angels and that I found them amazing and fierce and faithful. I found great comfort in the belief that there were created beings like me but not like me who spent their time worshiping and serving God. This morning, we're going to begin a series on what the Bible says about angels. Now, why should we study what the Bible says about angels? A couple of reasons. For one, like I said earlier, this can be a point of connection to our increasingly secular age. Even those who aren't certain that they believe that God exists are intrigued with angel stories. And maybe that's you. And if that's the case, then I hope you'll come every Sunday in April as we see what the Bible has to say about these interesting creatures. But those of us who believe in the Bible, we have another reason to uh, study about angels. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that all scripture is inspired of God and profitable. And that means that story after story after story in the Bible about angel encounters, those things are profitable as well. And so let's see what profit we can get in looking at what the Bible has to say about angels. So we begin today by looking at what angels do, and then next week we'll look at what angels are, and then the week after that we're going to look at whom angels fight. In other words, we're going to look at spiritual warfare. And then on the fourth Sunday, or the last Sunday of April, we're going to look at whom angels worship. Because you see, a study of angels isn't just an end in itself. Angels worship Jesus. And if we're going to study angels properly, it's going to lead us to worshiping Jesus as well. And so that's what we're going to be doing. That's our outline across the next several weeks. What angels do, what angels are, whom angels fight, and whom angels worship. This morning, let's look at the Bible's job description for angels. What do angels do? If you've got your sermon notes there on the inside of your program, you can find a pen or a pencil. And let's write down five words as we come to them. First of all, praise. Angels praise God. Do you remember what Isaiah saw when 
uh, he entered into the throne room of heaven. He was caught up in this vision, and he describes it in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. He said, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim. This is one of the orders of the angels. Each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. With two they were flying. And they were calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. Now in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, the Apostle John sees this same vision and more. And he describes it in Revelation chapter 4. He says, At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, another order of angels. Day and night, they never stopped saying the same thing that Isaiah heard. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And then John says, whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. Now these 24 elders is it's probably a symbol, probably a picture of the people of God in our entirety. There were 12 Old Testament tribes, there were 12 apostles in the New Testament, and so these 24 elders was a symbol of, uh, of the entire assembly of God's people around the throne. But for today, I want you to notice what happens. When these four living creatures, these angelic beings, lift up praise to God, what do the 24 elders do? What do the people of God do in response? They get up off their thrones, they kneel down, they cast their golden crowns at the feet of Jesus and they worship Him. Angels praise uh, God and that leads us to praise God as well. And, and that ought to make you think a little differently about this ordinary building we're in today. Every Sunday we gather in this ordinary building and we listen to ordinary people lift up praise to God, a very ordinary human being bringing the word of God to you and an explanation and a sermon. And yet if these passages are correct that we're looking at, then we have holy company in this room with us every single Sunday. Doesn't that give you a reason to get up out of bed on a Sunday and come into a worship service? Because angels are gathered in that place as well. I want you to take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10. It's an odd verse for us. It says, It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her head because of the angels. Now in the context, Paul was talking about what women and men should do in the worshiping community and things that were appropriate, things that were inappropriate. And, and he got onto the subject of head coverings and, and that it was inappropriate for a man to have his head covered when he prays. And it was appropriate for a woman to have her head covered when she prayed or when she prophesied. And, and uh, that's a confusing passage of Scripture as far as how to apply it to today. And I talked about that at length some years ago when we were going through verse by verse a study of 1 Corinthians. And so... That study is on the website if you want to go and see what we had to say about that at the time. But for now, for today, I just want you to focus on the reason that Paul says that the people ought to behave in a certain way in worship. The reason was, what? Because of the angels. In the first century world, they were mindful of the fact that when they gathered together to praise Jesus, lift up his name in praise... They had to be mindful of the angels who had gathered in that place as well to listen to God's people praise Jesus' name. Now, I think that's fascinating. You know, in my years growing up, I was often told, too often, to behave so that I did not distract the people who were around me. But in every instance I was told that, I was thinking about the human people around me, the people who were sitting around me. I was not supposed to distract them. If this passage is right, 
then maybe we need to remember not to distract angels who have come into this place to worship with us as we lift up the name of Jesus. That's a remarkable thought, isn't it? So what should we do? If angels praise God, what should we do? According to Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5, when angels praise God, the 24 elders fall down and worship God as well. We need to do that too. We need to praise God as angels are praising God. Here's another word to write down, promote. Angels promote Christian obedience. Whenever you pray the Lord's Prayer, you mention angels. Did you know that? Let's recite the Lord's Prayer together. You know it. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's stop right there. What did you just say? Thy will be done on earth, just like what? As it is done in heaven. Well, who's doing God's will in heaven? Angels are. Every time you lift up the Lord's Prayer in a recovery group meeting, every time you lift up the Lord's Prayer in a church service, every time you lift up the Lord's Prayer in a wedding ceremony, you're mentioning angels. Did you know that? Angels uh, promote Christian obedience. What we're doing in the Lord's Prayer is we're asking God to bring about a time on this earth, in our lives, in the lives of the people we love, that God's will is done as perfectly as angels do it in heaven. How do angels do God's will in heaven? Four ways, you can write these down. First of all, submissively. When angels obey God, it is not just the outward form, while inside they're sullen and resentful. That can be our case sometimes, right? Sometimes we obey just simply because we don't want to suffer the consequences if we don't. We don't believe in the rule. We're just afraid of being caught. And so we are obeying on the outside, but not on the inside. But angels obey God submissively. Number two, completely. Angels are not selective in what portion of God's will they're going to obey. That's not the case with all of us in this room. We might attend church regularly, but be inconsistent when it comes to God's rules on stewardship. Or we might be really faithful on God's rules on stewardship, but we are bitter and unforgiving towards somebody. And the Bible tells us that we shouldn't be that way. We are selective in what rules we decide to follow. That's not the case in God's angels in heaven. They obey God completely. Third, they obey uh, God joyfully. You know, there are some of us who we know God's rules and we maybe try to follow them, but we see them as a prison sentence, something we have to endure. If we want to go to heaven, uh, we, we think, you know, we don't understand grace. And so we think, all right, I need to do this. I need to do this. I need to do this. I don't like it, uh, I'm, but I'm going to avoid what I'm not supposed to do because I want to go to heaven when I die. That's the kind of attitude we have toward God's will, but not the angels. The angels fully trust that when God says to do something, that God's best, God has our best intentions in mind and the best intentions for the universe in mind, and they joyfully obey God's will. And then forth constantly. There are no revival meetings for angels. We need them from time to time, like the Asbury revival that took place recently. We need those moments from time to time ourselves. But angels don't. Have you ever thought about that? Because there's never a time when angels flag. There's no time when they kind of slow down and they start getting apathetic toward things. They are always constantly obeying God's will. And so whenever you pray the Lord's Prayer and you get to that line, Thy will be done here on earth as it is done in heaven, what you're doing is you're praying, God, bring about that time in my life. Bring about that time in my church's life. Bring about that time in my family's life where we are doing your will as joyfully and constantly and consistently as the angels do your will in heaven. Now, angels aren't robots. Um, we're going to look at this in a little more next week when we talk about what angels are. But angels think independently. They will independently. They feel independently, just like you and I. And yet they have independently chosen to joyfully and constantly and consistently obey God. We're going to see in a couple of weeks that the Bible tells us before the world was even created, some angels chose to disobey God and break away. And some angels chose to remain with God. So they are thinking, feeling, willing being just like you and me. They choose just like you and I do. And the reality is that if we can think about a free being in this universe, a whole bunch of free beings in this universe who are 
independent in their thinking, independent in their feeling, independent in their cho uh, choices and decision making, and yet they always joyfully do what God tells them to do. That should be convicting for us. We need to make sure that we are seeking to do God's will on this earth as it is done in heaven. Here's a third word, proclaim. Angels proclaim God's message. Angels proclaim God's message. In fact, this is literally what the word angel means in the biblical languages. In the Old Testament, most of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Uh, most of the New Testament was written in Greek. The Hebrew word for angel is malak. The last uh, book of the Bible is Malachi, which means my messenger. That was spoken of this prophet named Malachi. But the word malak is also used often of angels in the Old Testament to speak of a messenger who's delivering a word from God. And then, of course, in the New Testament, we have the word angelos. And the word angelos, of course, is transliterated into the English word angel. That's where we get the English word angel. And both angelos and malak both mean messenger. Now, on that first Easter morning, when the women went to mourn at the tomb, the angel who met them was serving as an angelos an angel, a messenger to bring God's word to them. And throughout the Bible, angels appear to people to tell them what they should do and to tell them what God is getting ready to do and to help them sort out confusing times and difficult times. The question is, do, do angels still do that for us today? My answer is, of course they do. Have you ever had this moment where you were discouraged or when you were tempted and just out of the blue, there was this snippet of a praise chorus or this little phrase from a Bible passage that comes into your mind. You hadn't thought about it for years and all of a sudden there it is. That's an angel letting your soul know something that you needed to be reminded of. If you've ever felt some sort of prompting to call somebody up or take them to lunch and talk with them about Jesus, it could well be that it's the same angel prompting you that was prompting Philip uh, you remember the story in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8 verse 26 says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. The Spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. So this story is a story about an Ethiopian official that has gone into Jerusalem to worship. He was attracted to the, uh, the uh, Old Testament worship and the worship in, in Jerusalem at the temple. And he, he, he comes back, he's heading back into Ethiopia. He's got a portion of scripture with him. Scripture was very expensive at that time. Nobody had apps on their phones or anything like that. And so he only had a portion of scripture, something from Isaiah. And he was trying to figure it out. He was trying to read it and trying to understand it. And so the angel of the Lord says to Philip, I want you to go along this road, and when a chariot goes by, I want you to go up to that chariot and engage in conversation with this Ethiopian official. Now it's interesting in this, in this passage, you notice how in, in one sentence it says an angel of the Lord prompted him. In another sentence it says the Holy Spirit prompted him. And that's interesting how it shows up like that so many times in the Bible where it's difficult to know whether it's a, an angel of the Lord or the Lord himself that is speaking to somebody. And that ought to let you know something about the message that angels communicate. The message that angels communicate is, is exactly what God wants them to communicate. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing different. Exactly the, the thing that God wanted them to share is going to be shared so that you see in the Bible it's almost interchangeable whether it's the Lord himself or an angel who's doing this communicating. Over and over again in the Bible we see this. And one of the things this lets us know is that angels aren't just mailroom clerks. You know, they're not just, you know, errand boys. These are ambassadors of God. And when they come to us and when they speak to us, they still have the residual glory of the throne room on them. That's why so many times when an angel does appear and all is glory to somebody, what's his first word? Don't be afraid. Why do you think he said that? Because they were standing before an angel that made them very much afraid. These are glorious creatures. And another thing, though, that we learn, though, is if... If an angel is communicating a word of God to us, an angel is never going to communicate something that, that contradicts what God has already said in his word. We need to remember that. There's so many, especially in the sort of new age community, there are so many angel stories where angels come and reassure that a decision that somebody made is right or a way of living they decided to live is right. God's angels, God's angels are never going to tell you something that is contradicted in his word. Angels are messengers. They are messengers of God himself. Here's a third word to write down, and this may surprise you. 
punish. Angels punish those who disobey God and harm God's people. Now strangely, this work of angels is all throughout the Bible and yet hardly in any modern angel story, even among believers who tell angel stories. For the most part, if modern people were asked to list all of the things they think angels do, most would never get around to listing off this one that shows up in the Bible a lot. In her book titled, A Book of Angels, The Psychic and the Medium, Sophie Burnham wrote that angels, quote, pour their blessings on us overwhelmingly. They play with us. They look after us. They heal us. They comfort us with invisible warm hands. And always they try to give us what we want. Angels always bring a calm and peaceful serenity that descends sweetly over you. Now, where did she get these words? She didn't get these words from Jesus. I mean, here's what Jesus said, Matthew chapter 13, verse 41, the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. Lawrence S. Cunningham, he's an emeritus professor of theology in Notre Dame, and he reviewed all the pop culture references to angels, and he said, angels seem to be friendly folk. That is, if we don't read our Bibles too carefully. <laughs> you know, I'm a law-abiding citizen, and I respect the rules of the road, but when I'm driving and I see a police cruiser, you know what I do? I check my speed. You do too, all right? If we're aware of the fact that angels are all around us, angels who have an opinion about how we behave and what choices we make. Do you think that might make a difference? Maybe we check our speed. Maybe we look to our lives for any unholiness that shouldn't be there. One of the words that the Bible uses for angels is the watchers. You know, psychologists tell us that you are much more likely to do what you ought to do if you think you're watched. Uh, they've done study after study of this. For example, in a break room where there was a tip jar and uh, people could come in and get their coffee and then leave money behind on the honor system for that cup of coffee and the other products and things. They found that if they put a sign up that had a pair of eyes on the sign, people were much more likely to leave a tip than if they just put a sign up that had daisies or flowers on it. They found this uh, was the case too in the break room when uh, uh, there were signs up that told people to clean up after they had uh, had their lunch and not leave all their mess on the table for the next person to clean up. When they had this picture of flowers on it and said, clean up your mess, people are a lot less likely to clean up their mess. But when it had a picture of eyes on it, what do you think happened? People cleaned up their mess. We need to be aware of the fact that there are watchers all around us. And do you think that it might cause us to do what we do when we see a patrol car? I think so. Even if we're generally law-abiding according to God's law, we're going to check our lives for unholiness and do what we can to fix that for the sake of the watchers. Here's a fifth word I want you to write down, protect. Angels protect us in accordance with God's plans for us. That last phrase in the sentence is very important, in accordance with God's plans for us. When people are asked um, about angels today, uh, most of the time what people want to know is are there guardian angels are angels here to protect and a lot of times when people are telling stories even secular angel stories it's mostly about protection and, and, and sometimes people hear these stories and it doesn't fill them with comfort it fills them with frustration because they want to know well why did if that's the case, that there's a guardian angel that protected that person, why was this person not protected? If that person walked away from a car wreck, why was this person uh, uh, injured or killed in a car wreck? Was, was their angel asleep at the wheel? What's happening here? We need to understand that angels uh, protect in accordance with God's plans for us, in accordance with God's will for us. And so when we are protected, when we are healed, when some surprising good news comes our way, we praise God for that. And when those things don't happen, we've got to learn to trust God in the midst of that. You know, we love the story in Acts chapter 12 of how an angel rescued Simon Peter when he was in prison uh, and he was to be executed the next day. Uh, you may have run across this story before. Take a look, Acts chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up and follow me, the angel told him. And Peter followed him out of the prison. 
They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. And when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. And God sent an angel to ensure that his apostle, Simon Peter, would not be executed the next day. And some of us would say, well, of course, that's the way it works. He was an important man. Uh, God was going to look out for important people. God was going to look out for people who were uh, instrumental in advancing his causes and purposes in this, in this life. If that's the way you, you, you assume things, then you have a read Acts chapter 12. Because the beginning of Acts chapter 12 tells us about another apostle. Simon Peter was an apostle. He was rescued. Another apostle was not. Take a look at Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. So one apostle was rescued right after another apostle was put to death. And according to Scripture, both experiences were within the will and the plan of God for His mysterious sovereign glory. Both of those plans advanced his purposes for this world and for his church. And we need to rejoice when our experiences are like Simon Peter, and we need to trust when our experiences are more like James. Now, since most of the Christian and non-Christian angel stories today have to do with angelic protection, one of the things that people often ask is, does each person have a guardian angel? Do I have a guardian angel? Now, I can't find any evidence of that in the Bible, but I do like what John Calvin had to say about guardian angels, and maybe we need to leave it like this. He wrote, whether or not each believer has a single angel assigned to him for his defense, I do not positively affirm. If anyone does not think it enough to know that all the orders of the heavenly host are perpetually watching for his safety, I do not see what he could gain by knowing he has one angel as a specific guardian. I love that. It's comforting, I think, for some people to feel like they have a guardian angel looking out for them. How much more comforting should it be that you have, as he put it here, all the orders of the heavenly host watching out for us? And that's exactly what we have. Uh, in 2 Kings chapter 6, we read about an event that took place in Elisha, the prophet Elisha's life. At one point in Elisha's life, the Aramean army surrounded him, and Elisha's servant went out and saw all these enemies getting ready to come in to take the prophet and his servant. And he runs in in a panic, Elisha, what shall we do? And Elisha said this, 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 16 and 17, don't be afraid, the prophet answered, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. That's what we need to pray for each other. That's what we need to pray for our loved ones. That's what we need to pray for our life group members. That's what we need to pray for our friends. Lord, open our eyes to the fact that you have watchers and protectors all around us. This world's a dangerous place that you send your kids out into. I don't just mean dangerous physically, although it's that too. It's dangerous spiritually. We need to recognize as parents, we need to trust that God's on the job and he's got his angels on the job. And we need to look for and ask God to send his angels to protect our kids and protect our loved ones as they go through all the experiences that they do and as we go through all the experiences that we do. My prayer at the conclusion of this message is, O oh Lord, open our eyes. Make us aware of everything the angels do around us. Open our eyes to those mysterious beings who worship you. Open our eyes to those mysterious beings who set us an example of obedience. Open our eyes to those who deliver messages to us audibly and inaudibly. Open our eyes to those who punish according to your justice and who protect according to your mercy. And most of what we've looked at today has to do with what angels do now for us in this life. But Jesus at one point also told us that angels have a role to play in the next life. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12 verses 8 and 9, I tell you whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. 
But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. These magnificent, mysterious beings that we have looked at from God's word today are not only here to see after the goings on of our life now, they are going to be the watchers, they're going to be the observers, they're going to be the audience. When Jesus says, come to me or depart from me, I never knew you. And it all happens, according to this passage, according to Jesus, whether you, as he said, acknowledge him before others. What does that mean? How do you acknowledge him before others? Remember, in the midst of the music, we had a baptism, and Olivia was baptized. That's how you acknowledge Jesus before others. That's how you publicly profess your faith in Jesus Christ. And maybe that's a step that some of you need to take. You need to come into a relationship with Jesus and acknowledge him before others. And if that's the case, then I want to talk with you. And let's, let's get some of your questions figured out. And then let's, let's see if we can get a baptism scheduled for you as well. Because that's how we begin the process of publicly professing him in front of other people. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us as we go through this study of angels today and across the next few Sundays. We want to have our eyes opened up to what your word has to say about these marvelous, mysterious beings. It's not just to satisfy our curiosity, although our curiosity will be satisfied as we go through this study. It is for our profit. The Bible tells us that all scripture is inspired by you and profitable to make us the people you want us to be. And so all this study of angels, all these stories of angels, all these characteristics of angels that we're going to look at are for our profit, are for our well-being. We ask, Lord, that you would make us uh, more trusting in you, more excited about our relationship with you, uh, more confident in what you intend for our lives because of what we study about angels today and across the next several Sundays. Today, Lord, we ask that you would help us all to realize that uh, angels are with us now and will be before the presence of angels after we die. And Jesus himself said that he will acknowledge we belong to him before the angels or he will say, depart from me. Lord, we ask that you would help us to say yes to you today and begin that process of acknowledging you before others so that we can hear you acknowledge us before the angels at the end of time. It may be that you need to pray a prayer, something like this, to, come, to become a believer. Maybe you need to pray something like this. Jesus, come into my life and be my Savior and Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross to take away my sin. I ask you to take it away now and give me a clean, new heart inside. Help me to learn more about you and how to follow you all the days of my life. I look forward to the day, Lord, that you will acknowledge I belong to you before the very angels of heaven. Heavenly Father, we pray that those who've prayed that prayer will take that next step and be ready to acknowledge you before others, as the Bible tells us to in the waters of baptism. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.